was I went on every person that we had mutual friends of and I posted nasty rumors about Lindsay and it's something that I seriously regret every day. Something that I definitely have to live with every day. What if a complete stranger, or worse, someone you know, someone you trust, decides to ruin your life? How easy would it be for them to destroy your online career, take away all your credibility and your social life? I looked over and I realized these two men were whispering and kind of staring my way. And as I walked past, I heard one of them say, is that her? And they were kind of like laughing. That was really the first time that I had seen someone talk about me like right in front of my face. Like my stomach dropped. I just was assuming everyone was talking about me wherever I went. That's Lizzie and Ashley. Lizzie is a former cyber bully who's agreed to share her story with us. Ashley is from the sci-fi show, The Internet Ruined My Life. And thank you both so much for being on the podcast with us. I'm America's digital pro, Kim Commando. What would you do if, from out of the blue, someone started bad-mouthing you, lying about you, slandering you, stealing your content, basically ruining your life online? Now, this is not the same as cyberbullying. I'm talking about a malicious intent to totally destroy and ruin your life. Malicious posting goes a long way, way beyond cyberbullying. The instigator actually attacks the victim with words and pictures with only one goal in mind to destroy them. What I did was horrible. I singled someone else out online, and I can't believe I'm admitting it right now. I understand how much words can impact someone, and I've been on both sides of it, and it's not pretty either way. And what I did, yes, it can be, it is called cyberbullying. And you know what? A lot of them get away with it. If it goes viral, websites are less likely to remove the post. Why? Well, websites certainly love traffic. And then traffic loves advertisers. Advertisers pay money, so you can see how it all goes around. If you live and die by your online reputation and a post about you goes viral, you're just about as good as dead. Technically speaking, it takes about 8,000 likes for a post to go wacko viral. How it performs in the first hour determines the rate at which likes and views multiply. But going viral isn't the only way a post could ruin your life. A targeted post shared with your friends, groups, and family members would be just enough ammunition to alienate you. That happened to Monica Glennon. She's a real estate agent, mother of two, wife of a veteran Marine. Her phone rang at 6 a.m. It was the call that would ruin her. It was one of her real estate buddies calling to warn her that a photo of her had been found on the website called She's a Homewrecker. All right, the She's a Homewrecker website is dedicated to exposing, degrading, discrediting, quote-unquote, the other woman. Basically, concubines caught having adulterous sex with married men, and apparently Monica was their catch of the day. The website claimed that she had sexual relations with a man on the floor of a home that she was showing, and that a divorce was now in progress. Was it true? Imagine waking up one day to learn your name and face have been plastered on a gossip website with accusations that you had an affair and destroyed someone's marriage. He sent me a screenshot of what was posted, and I was absolutely petrified. Well, true or not, the story caught fire. Post by post, comment by comment, reaction by reaction. Well, all the damage was done. The story had been already viewed nearly 100,000 times. It shot up to the number one search result for Monica, spelled with a K, on Google.com. So what this all means is that it went viral. Within a year, her home listings dropped by half. Dropping right beside them was her income. She lost over $200,000 in business since that post. I have made six-figure income, and it is pretty much gone. Unthinkable, right? Well, we're not going to leave you hanging. We'll finish both of those stories in this podcast. But my main question to you is, what if that happened to you? How could you avoid it? Who would do such a thing anyway? Would you be able to sue? How would you clean up the Internet of all the lies that were told about you? So stick around for the best defense against Internet defamation. Coming up right after this short message from one of our amazing sponsors. Sponsors. 
if it's somebody that knows me and now know that I'm not going to let it go after 10 months, it is really scary. People have hurt people for less than that. Monica was in shock. The sex story couldn't have been any more damaging or untrue. She had no idea who had hurt her so badly. At one time, she thought, well, maybe it was a real estate competitor. It turns out a man by the name of Ryan Baxter had shared the home record post with Monica's husband, Scott, along with friends, family members, and contacts. Ryan coldly messaged Scott on Facebook saying, hey, sorry to be the one to let you in on this. Monica did hire an attorney, but it still took months for IP addresses and the records of all the internet service providers involved to be released and subpoenaed. And that is a major hassle, by the way, and super expensive. $100,000 later, Monica and her lawyer tracked down the original troublemaker, and she was indeed a total stranger. And Ryan, he was actually a she named Hannah, who had set up a fake online profile just to compound the damage done to Monica. After further investigations and research, Hannah's internet activity showed that she liked to rub salt in the open wounds of those who were being targeted. Hannah, it appeared, was an online sadist. But why? What could have possibly inspired total strangers to wreck her life? This would have been so bad if she didn't start something I'd like to not have had occur called a fight, a major fight between the two of us. And I saw, you know, what Lindsay had said back, thinking that it was me, and I was so stupid and immature. And what I did, yes, it can be, it is called cyberbullying, and it's not okay. It wasn't okay then, it's not okay now. As you heard in Lizzie's case, people have their reasons. You never know if a comment you make online is going to upset someone else especially if he or she is a little off the deep end. All right, Lizzie wasn't off the deep end, by the way, but she did have an emotional flare-up that caused her to do the revenge posting. Issues like politics, abortion, women's rights, gun control, racial and religion-based issues, even animal rights, they all cause these emotional flare-ups, these heated debates, mudslinging, name-calling online. At its very worst, disagreements escalate into reputation bashing, slander, libel, and finally, fake lies and pictures designed to totally ruin someone else's life. After I sent the tweet, I just went to bed. That next morning is where everything pretty much completely changed. I woke up and I looked at my phone and immediately I knew something was wrong. I had like 2,000 emails. I had gone from like 800 followers to like three or 4,000. My mind was blown. And then I thought about it. I was like, this has to be because of that tweet. That was Nicole from The Internet Ruined My Life, who posted a spoiler and nearly ruined her acting career and the actors' lives around her. It's amazing how quickly lies go viral. Monica's posting mistake was a little different. She decided to engage in what I like to call an emotionally charged post, sensitive topics like the ones I named earlier. Monica saw a post from a teenager who went to visit Auschwitz. Of course, you know, the concentration camp. The teen shared a selfie with a smile and tweeted it out. Apparently, a lot of people were mortified that she would be tweeting in a pic with a smile while standing in the middle of a concentration camp. So it went viral. Alabama TV station WHNT News shared the tweet to their Facebook page, asking fans to share their thoughts. Boy, sure they did. An onslaught of derogatory and hurtful comments charged right up there against the teenager. Monica Glennon took her side. She basically said, hey, come on, you know, kids make mistakes. Then she criticized the mudslinger, saying, and I quote, This shows the same judgmental and senseless pack mentality that led to this horrific time in history to begin with. Let's just say that Monica didn't make too many friends that day, but she did make a new enemy, a woman of Jewish descent by the name of Molly Rosenblum. Now, Monica, being Polish, reminded Molly that Jews weren't the only ones who were massacred at Auschwitz, and that Auschwitz belonged to all and was a former killing zone of all, including Polish people. After a heated back-and-forth exchange, Monica went about her business, and she forgot all about it. Molly, however, did not forget. In her own words, she was making some poor decisions at the time, which included a kidnapping. 
By her own account on Facebook, she was hopped up on meth. So after mulling over the battle in her head, she decided to fire back by killing Monica's online reputation. The story went to Homewrecker, then went to a local news source. After some time had passed, she stirred up trouble again. So for Molly, the offender, it was personal. The story she fabricated was unthinkable. It was totally fake. Now, before I tell you what happened, I want to talk about what's legally happening here. I'm not a lawyer. I can't give you legal advice. But let's talk a little bit about it. This mudslinging, is it protected under freedom of speech or is it libel? Is it slander? Is it defamation of character? And did it considerably damage someone else's reputation? This is a huge legal topic. So we're just going to gloss over it today because I want to get to the meat of this podcast, which is what happened to Monica and what can you do if this ever happens to you? Because there's such a super fine line between the right to freedom of speech and the right to protect your reputation, it's hard to tell when a personal remark is actually, quote unquote, defamation. You see, defamation is this broad term that describes any statement that hurts someone else's reputation. If the statement is made in writing and published, it's called libel. If the statement is spoken, it's called slander. Now, a person suffering as a result of defamation has due recourse to sue the person who made the statement. And since spoken word tends to fade over time, libel, again, that's published, is considered more harmful than slander. Unless, of course, the statement was recorded and then broadcast. So here come the debates. People should feel free to talk about their negative experiences in a truthful manner, right? On the other hand, people have a right to defend themselves against statements that damage their reputation. Okay, both are correct and defensible, especially when something is publicized. But publication can only take place when a third party sees, hears, or reads the defamatory statement. So if someone paints a defamatory statement right on your front door or in your car and a third party sees it, well, this is where it gets kind of crazy. It's technically published. But when it comes to elected officials and public figures, the public is actually given more freedom to rant and rave. People in the public eye are less protected from defamatory statements. The odds are stacked against us when we try to sue someone for defamation. If someone says something false and incriminating about me, I actually have to prove he or she did it with actual malice with intent to harm. And as you might expect, I've had my share of false statements said about me over the years. I even had somebody in the radio industry on his show, I'm not going to say who it was, call me a whore and a slut. But I don't take it too hard. Life's too short. All right, back to our story. Just after Monica filed a lawsuit, a mysterious man appeared on a website called Report My Ex claiming to be the one who had cheated with her, even going as far as to detail the act itself. Again, this is all a total fabrication, but he basically put the nail in the coffin in terms of Monica's career. Now, let me say this. Whether it's cyberbullying somebody at school or going after a big corporation, if you maliciously intend to falsely damage someone's reputation, you can be prosecuted. It's that simple. And if railing against people is someone else's idea of fun, there are plenty of websites out there that will gladly let them do it. They can take their pick. But under the terms of service of most of these websites, the posts must be factually true. But even if the posts are not true, you probably won't be able to prosecute the site itself. You see, there's a special section, section number 230 of the Communications Decency Act that protects websites from being sued for the things that their users say. So, of course, when Monica wrote to the sites to explain telling them that it was all a fake, none of them would take it down. Why should they? Site visits were huge at this point. Traffic was crazy. So Monica took her only option available. This is actually pretty clever. The copyright infringement angle. The poster had used her professional headshot which technically she has ownership of. Copyright and ownership are two super important points here, so make note of it. Meanwhile, Monica's income just drained away. She was so afraid that men would expect sex during a routine house showing. She had to bring her husband along whenever she showed vacant homes. She became so fearful that she had to lock down her house with a whole bunch of cameras. 
So what happens if there's something about you online? A posting, an image, maybe even a news story. Is it possible to clean up your online reputation? Well, stay right where you are. I've got some experts who are going to help answer those questions and more here on this Commando On Demand podcast. But first, a special thank you to one of our sponsors. All right, bombs are dropped. Explosions happen. Damage is done. Your reputation, is it shot? Can you do anything about it? Well, you can either take matters into your own hands and try and clean up the fallout. You can hire a lawyer to try and go after the culprit. Or you can hire a professional to restore your reputation for you. There are a lot of companies out there that say that they can clean up your online reputation. One of the leaders in this field is a woman by the name of Shannon Wilkinson. Shannon is the founder and CEO of Reputation Communications. She and her team, they help CEOs, C-suite executives, stars, and VIPs take control of their online reputation. Big sites like the Wall Street Journal call her all the time. Recently, she weighed in on the Urban Meyer Ohio State fiasco and Uber's ongoing CEO crisis. Hi there, Shannon. Thanks for joining us today on this podcast. Thank you, Kim. It's great to be here. Now, according to your website, it says that you're a reputation management expert. Can you tell us exactly what does that mean? How far does it go? Well, in today's world, you are who Google says you are. If you don't present yourself online the way you want the world to see you, the world will do it for you. And it may not have your best interest at heart. We experts help you create, shape, and amplify your personal brand. And by that, I mean the image you want to represent you online in your profiles, your photographs, and any other information that people want to research about you. Well, that's so important. Let me rephrase that. It's actually, it's necessary. More and more people just jump to the internet whenever they're researching a prospective employee, employer, student, or investor. You just Google somebody's name and it seems to be all there online. Every college admissions board, prospective employer, future date goes online to conduct research before they make a decision about you. These people are not just evaluating your reputation. They're reading your social media shares. They want to evaluate your political, social, and personal views. They also are checking out your judgment regarding how you express yourself and your views. Um, Something else they're looking at are the people that you associate with on social media and in your photographs on the internet. They want to see if they may pose reputation risk to their brand if they hire or associate with you. In fact, the Wall Street Journal published an article today about exactly this topic. Um, Now, something else that a lot of corporations do when they're considering hiring or partnering or investing with someone, you know, on a higher level, not a ground floor employee, but someone on the C-suite level, it's very routine for them to conduct a due diligence search. They'll hire a due diligence firm, and the due diligence firm looks at virtually all of this. So how would you help a large corporation in that case? My firm conducts uh, reputation risk reports for investigative firms, for example, and we look at social media shares, if, if it's something that includes any sort of discriminatory comment like racism, sexism, anything like that, uh, we include a picture of those shares on our reports. I mean, we've seen it happen. One false post, one silly picture, one off-color comment. It can really ruin your life. It really depends on what it is and how it's perceived by the world at large and a particular industry. If you're promoting liquor brands or in advertising, I think there's a lot more leeway. But imagine the impact of a blog completely devoted to criticizing your company or you as a manager or a fake website in your name that mocks you that you have no control over. Worse is a news article that mistakenly included your name in coverage about career criminals who launder money and maybe are involved in drug transport. If that is reprinted online in 25 other media outlets, which is very common, that can just be completely destructive on your life. It's really scary to think about. But let me ask you a question. 
How difficult is it to restore a marred online reputation back to a respectable one? It really depends on two or three factors. The first factor is how much real estate on Google does that information take up on the first page or two of your Google results? Um, the average Google page has 10 entries, and this is the same on all search engines. So if it takes up the entire page, it's going to require a lot of time and new content to even remove 50% of it. And the reason is, if, if something like this comes out on blogs or in the media, those are very, very high-ranking sites. So to move that information down lower, even off the first page, you have to create a strategy to publish a lot of content that's higher ranking that will move it down. The second issue that determines this is, does the person who is a victim of this do they have a lot of information already about themselves on the first page of Google? Did they have a LinkedIn, a Wikipedia site? Did they contribute to blogs? Were they interviewed in the media? You know, do they own their name on the first page of Google? In most cases that we work with, the people did not. So it really depends on a range of factors, but the bottom line is that it can take a year to turn around a situation like that, depending on where the content exists and how much of it there is. I've seen this firsthand. People can be so mean online. It's like maybe they shouldn't have had a forum to suddenly express themselves, but they hop online and in this spirit of anonymity, and they're not, they just think that they can say whatever they want to say. My advice is buyer beware. There are a lot of good firms out there doing this work, and there are a lot of um, dubious firms that promise quick results that they can wipe away content. Sometimes content can be removed in a few weeks. It usually takes you know, three to 12 months. So my advice is before you hire a firm, take advantage of the free resources that are online that explain how online reputation management works, what personal branding is. We publish an extensive article called The Essentials on our website. It walks readers through the process of establishing or repairing an online brand. It provides tips on how to avoid reputation firms that may not be above board. Uh, we also publish articles by attorneys about what to do if you face online defamation. Without mentioning any names, can you give me an example of how you would I don't know, piece together someone's shattered internet life. One very serious uh, issue we helped with was a long-standing, well-established professional with multiple degrees, you know, a 20-year career, completely above board. Her name was mistakenly included in an article about criminals that was instantly republished in multiple areas of the internet all around the world. And this was completely distressing because the person was in the middle of a job search. She also did not have a website. She had a very low profile on the Internet, which meant that all of this material showed up on the first page of Google. So the first thing we did was create a personal branding campaign about her. We created a professional website about her with her you know, professional biography. We created a blog by her. We arranged for articles in her area of expertise to be published online. We created her Twitter, Facebook account. We also set her up with attorneys who specialize in internet issues, and they started reaching out to the publications to explain what the error was. Uh, this person spent tens of thousands of dollars in legal fees before one of her attorneys recommended us. So we worked on the project for a year and a half, and I'm pleased to say that virtually all of the material has been removed from American search engines. It is now being removed in other parts of the world, and all of the material that we created is dominating the results of Google when you research her. Well, you know me. I always love happy endings. That's just awesome. All right. We have time in this podcast for one more story. Do you have something you'd like to share? Another example of someone I gave advice to was someone had been promoted to manager of the company that he worked for. And as soon as this happened, someone started impersonating him 
on multiple social media channels. Uh, they used his name as a Twitter handle, and multiple times a day, they tweeted and posted vulgar, profane, inappropriate language that looked as though it came from this person. It became so bad that this person went to the police to try and get help because he did not know what to do. We gave him advice on how to approach Twitter and all of these platforms to inform them that these were fake accounts. So every time he got one closed down, three more would start up. And so my advice to your listeners is to always take control and ownership of your name on every top social media channel, starting with yourname.com. You know, if your name is Joe Smith, go to Google Domains, googledomains.com. You can reserve your name or your name with your middle name for $12 a year. And that keeps it from being used by someone else who may have the same name or may not have your best interest at heart. You should also go to Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat. Always reserve your name if it's available on any social media channel because that way people with bad intentions cannot use it to try and harm your reputation. That's great advice. You want to own every possible domain name, any way that it can be spelled. I know that we've done here over at Commando. We own a ton of domains. All right. So if somebody wants to learn more about you, how can they contact you? Please follow me on Twitter at Reputation News and Shannon New York. I also want to give a plug for my upcoming ebook. It's called Reputation Reboot. It's an insider's guide for CEOs, C-suite executives, and rising stars. It tells them what they need to know before they hire an online reputation firm. It will be published on Amazon in September. That's great, Shannon. Thanks so much for sharing your expertise on the podcast. Thank you, Kim, and thank you for everything you're doing to help everybody be safer and better on the Internet. Remember, what you post today could come back to haunt you years from now. Just recently, the New York Times came under fire after someone dug up dirt on their technology journalist, Sarah Jung, and Walt Disney allegedly severed ties with the Guardians of the Galaxy director, James Gunn, due to his questionable tweets from years ago. Gunn says that his comments were wildly insensitive and they don't reflect the person I am today. But Disney, they don't care about the person he is today as much as they care about their own reputation and brand. So the bottom line, they ousted him. Anything you say can and will be used against you. Your online reputation can make you or it can break you. Now, what if, hypothetically, but it's true for so many of us, what if you can't afford to hire a law firm or a restoration expert? Before we get to all that, just stay right where you are, because I have to extend a special thank you to our partners in this podcast. They help make it possible. Now, what if, hypothetically, but it's true for so many of us, what if you can't afford to hire a law firm or a restoration expert? Well, here's what you want to do. Start by Googling yourself. Also, did you know that Google offers a completely free reputation monitoring tool? It's called Me on the Web, and it will alert you anytime Google finds your personal information on a public website. Anytime your name, your email address, physical address, phone number, or whatever information you tell Google to scan for pops up, you'll be notified. If you do find something horrendous, you can attempt to have it removed from Google's search engine in that whole section called Me on the Web. Once you're there... Head to the section called How to Remove Unwanted Content. Google walks you through the process of removing the inflammatory item. But remember, if Google complies, it's only going to remove links via the search engine results. You see, Google normally honors a court order to remove content, but they are being more cautious. Certain parameters must be met in order to execute a content takedown. So be sure to be honest. And you have to ask yourself, has your business been affected? Has there been any loss to your business that you can actually prove? Have you lost customers or received responses related to the negative content? If you can answer yes to any of those, you may be able to convince both Google and the web hosting company to wipe some or all the content off, especially if it violates the site's terms. But you'll have to contact the web host yourself. Listen, I hope it works for you, but don't expect miracles from every single website under the globe. If your picture is drawing lots of attention, the website will probably not respond. In that case, you have to go someplace else. 
That's the Internet Crime Complaint Center at ic3.gov. And you don't have to use Google.com. Other online monitoring tools are cropping up, like Reputation.com. TweetBeep is a Google Alert type of service for Twitter posts. Monitor This scans multiple search engines for a specific term of your choice and then sends you the results back. These apps and tools tend to come and go quickly, so be sure to do your research before you download. And let's use another scenario. Let's say someone copies and publishes a photograph that you took, a blog post that you wrote, or a stolen design of your web page. In that case, you're a victim of copyright infringement, and you may be entitled to take legal action. As I said before, I can't give you legal advice, but I can tell you the name of the law that protects you. It's called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or DMCA for short. It's a huge topic. If all else fails, you have one more option. It takes some doing, but you can actually hide negative information under mounds and mounds of positive information. You literally have to load the Internet with good stuff about you or your business, then generate traffic to those sites in order to override the bad stuff. That's what Shannon Wilkinson does with some of her clients. Whatever avenue you take, make sure your name or your business name appears somewhere at the top of all your sites. Make sure that everything is search engine optimized. If you have some kudos from the media, make the most of it. Share it. Make sure people visit it. Remember that traffic and searches equal FaceTime. The more FaceTime you give to a positive site, the more obsolete the negative one becomes. So how did Monica's story end? Well, $100,000 later, Monica did win her lawsuits against both Molly and Hannah on claims of copyright violation, invasion of privacy, intentional infliction of emotional distress, and interference with her business. Search engines such as Google were ordered to de-index all versions of the posting. The judge also ordered She's a Homewrecker and Bad Biz Report to remove the post. She's a Homewrecker complied, but Bad Biz Report did not. Bad Biz responded by saying, and you'll love this, we don't respond to court orders. American lawyers just make us laugh. It's sad, but Bad Biz lives up to his name, Bad Business. Monica, on the other hand, wanted to be on the good business side, so she did a really brave thing. She actually reached out to her nemesis, Molly Rosenblum, in person. Can you believe it? I know, get this. They met at a restaurant. They chatted for four straight hours. You know, it's amazing what can happen when you actually meet face-to-face -face with someone who has a beef with you. It diffuses their anger, and sure enough... Molly found out that Monica wasn't so bad after all. In fact, they had a lot in common. After the meeting, Molly signed an affidavit confessing to everything. But try as she might, she was not allowed to remove her posts. On certain blabber sites like She's a Homewrecker, there's no delete button. Anything on that site, as well as shared sites, cannot be deleted by the original posters. But there's a loophole. The site will consider removal requests on a case-by-case -case basis. It just really depends on the circumstances. If a court finds the post to be false, then they'll usually remove it. And fortunately, in Monica's case, there's a happy ending. She's picking up the pieces and moving on. She's still in the real estate business selling homes. But as far as her online activities go, she's a lot more cautious these days. I hope no one else ever has to go through what I went through. I will have to live with it for the rest of my life. Everything you put online is public doesn't matter where you put it. It is extremely public and it stays there forever. You know, the things that I have said will be there for probably ever. And my grandkids could be looking, my great grandkids could be looking at my Facebook page and see the horrible things that I've done and said and think, who is this woman? And I don't, I don't want that for anyone else. If you're going to have a discussion that is even remotely negative, do it in person. Because more likely, you won't be able to do it in person because you really don't want to say the things that you say online. Thanks, Lizzie, for sharing your experience. Admitting that you were once a cyber bully is a really brave thing to do. I'm just glad to be on your good side. You can find Lizzie Maggio on YouTube. And thanks to the sci-fi show, The Internet Ruined My Life. They tell true-to-life stories about people whose lives were wrecked by Internet disasters. And thanks to our featured guest, Shannon Wilkinson of Reputation Communications. And good luck with your ebook launch. The key idea in this podcast is constant communication. I just love how tech makes it so easy for all of us to communicate. 
But I think in some cases, it makes it harder for us to understand each other. And there is a difference. Try to meet people face-to-face whenever possible. Use Skype, Zoom, FaceTime. People use the same facial expressions all around the world. A frown is a frown, a smile, a smile, and laughter is laughter. And as you know, it's not as easy to badmouth someone who's willing to sit down and discuss things. If you were inspired by today's podcast, let me know. Leave me a few words on whatever site you're on. Tell us how we're helping you with your technology. I really want to know your story. And one more thing. Our subscribers at Commando.com are some of the most technologically informed people on the entire planet. So be sure to keep listening because the tech times, they're changing. And we're going to keep you updated, I promise. I'm America's Digital Pro, Kim Commando. Thanks for joining us. And oh, by the way, if you really like this podcast, be sure to give us a good five-star rating and five-star review on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. That'd be awesome. Thanks. Thanks.